Hello everyone, this is Ty Green. If you lived in Damascus, Syria right now, would you pack up and leave? Realizing that Isaiah chapter 17 verse one hasn't been fulfilled yet. There's a lot of folk living there and a move by many that have become believers to stay and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, despite their persecutions. If you were one of these, would you stay? There's a lot of folk living there right now and a move by many of them that have become believers to stay and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, despite their persecutions. If you were one of these, would you stay? These are hard questions, but very real because the Bible gives us a heads up on so many things. And with judgment coming, the time frame shrinking, if you were living in Damascus, Syria right now, is it time to go? Look at this. Damascus, Syria was founded in the third millennium BC. It is widely known as amongst the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. It is one of the oldest cities in the Middle East. The city has some 125 monuments from different periods of its history. In the Middle Ages, it was the center of a flourishing craft industry specializing in swords and lace. The population in Damascus is just over 2.6 million in 2023. It has been through rough times before and even now. According to Isaiah chapter 17 verse 1, there will come a time when Damascus will become a ruinous heap and inhabited no more. Isaiah chapter 17 verse 1 says, The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. We don't know how this happens, or what method of delivery, nor the origin country of the attack. What we do know is that afterwards, Jacob, Israel, is thinned out. Isaiah chapter 17 verse 4 says, And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. So after Damascus is a ruinous heap, we see a correlation with Israel, that Jacob's glory shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Whatever this means, it appears to be hard times for Israel. We know that through scripture that Israel is headed into their 70th week as a result of an offense against God. This is known as the time of Jacob's trouble and it will run alongside the tribulation. The span of seven years is a judgment upon the whole world as a result of sin and iniquity. As we note the event to come in Damascus, Syria, as to the closeness of its fulfillment, let us all remember this. There are many there that have no idea that this is soon coming. Much like many of the end time Bible prophecies that we've shared and studied over the years, the Bible warns us in those that have an ear to hear and to listen and to take heed to become aware of the shortness of the time as we live amongst the fig tree generation that will witness all of the remaining events leading into the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
Yet many in the world do not believe that this will happen or that it will happen within their lifetime. Second Peter chapter three, verse three, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Folks forget that there is an allotted time for all these events to happen. And we can see that some will occur like birth pangs with increasing succession. But there is a reason why it's a wake up call. Second Peter three and nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long suffering toward us. The fear, respect, and admonition of the Lord is waning upon the earth, but let it not be so with you. So I'm asking that we include them all in our prayers, no matter where they are in the world. God can reach where we cannot and whom we cannot. For the believers in Christ and also to the non-believers that they may come to know the love of the truth in Jesus Christ. Pray for those of our number in Damascus, Syria, which have endured heavy persecution along with many around the world. Pray for their strength in the Lord to endure the hardships that they face on a daily basis. We were praying for revival believing God would do a big work in Syria. Then the war came. Now the terrorists are attacking Christian homes, churches, and even our children. Their goal is to empty Syria of its Christians. We hate the spirit of Islam that is destroying our country, but we love our Muslim neighbors. They come to us and say, in the name of our God, terrorists rape and kill, where is God? We tell them about Jesus, and many are coming to know him. Still others say, we are like living in hell. As we watch the developments intensify in this area relative to the fulfillments of Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, let us not forget those in harm's way not only there, but everywhere. Pray for their salvation through Jesus Christ. So knowing all of this, the question remains, if you lived in Damascus, Syria right now, would you leave? Would you leave before it became a ruinous heap? See, Damascus can be illustrated as an example of knowing what scripture says will happen before it happens. Now this is specified to a particular city. Would you leave or stay? Here's why I pose the question, because we could see some things develop that we've cited within scripture. We may not have the ability to leave, whether physically or economically. Here's my point. If you find yourself in any of these situations, fear not and focus on how God will use you in the midst of the situation. Many of us have been preparing for the worst, and if the time came, we'd gather our families, go to another location, and hold it down there until things settle down. Certainly nothing wrong with that, because we know how people can get when things fall apart. I'm telling you, I've considered this myself. Just years ago, gather the family, tip out, and head up north. As men, our main focus is to protect our families, right? Whether we stay or go, we're assessing our abilities. So prayer and discernment is in order. Either way, think about how God can use you in the midst of things deteriorating around us. Our state of mind is extremely important, Second Timothy, Chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right, this was something I was just thinking about and wanted to share with you all. Keep your head up. Keep looking up. 
our redemption draws near. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Today is the day of salvation. Soon is the day of redemption. And after that is the day of the Lord. For believers, fear not, yet we have work to do. Jesus shared this word that as we watch, as he says in verse 37, we are not sleeping, but we are sharing the gospel. And salvation through Jesus Christ prepares the soul for that day of redemption. The Lord is coming for a harvest, and I want you to be there with the Lord when he appears. We are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Tomorrow isn't promised to any of us. James 4 and 14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What we're seeing around us is a falling world due to sin and iniquity. All through scripture, we see the plea to turn from wickedness and accept the love of the truth in Jesus Christ, that he died on that cross in our stead. He paid the debt of sin that every person owes. After his death, he was buried and on that third day, God raised him up as proof to the world that he is the son of God and that God did certainly send him. It's proof that God takes sin seriously and there is a penalty. It's also proof that he made a provision for us should we accept it. It is a gift of God. Ephesians chapter two, let's pick it up at verse seven. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For some of us, we don't see the need for the Savior until we need the Savior. We don't need saving until we need saving. We don't need Jesus till we need Jesus. Why does it even need to come to that? I know sometimes it does. For those that come to the Lord, we've all been there. So just come as you are. My favorite passage of scripture right here in Titus chapter three, right here. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We're a mess, but watch this. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our savior toward man appeared. See that? God loves us so much, he sent us a savior. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Man has an opportunity to be forgiven of sin by an act of a Savior sent by God that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Believe on Jesus. If you want to be saved, trust him in your heart. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation is indeed a gift of love, a gift of God. Receive the gift. All right, I will leave it right there till we meet again. Live holy before the Lord. Love y'all. Shalom.